They say the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Well, you, you and I, we were meant to be free. And now God invites you to a soul-shaking, chain-breaking, life-giving adventure with your closest friends. We will share our stories of struggle and bravely explore the uncharted places of our soul. We will do this together and promise one another we won't stop until we are free. Liberation awaits. Today, freedom calls out your name. This is the way, the new way to be free. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to Liquid Church. My name's Tim. I get to be one of the pastors here. And uh, glad you're here for our big series, Freeway. And uh, we actually have six campuses joining us all across the state. And we want to especially welcome Liquid Garwood to our church family. Would you welcome everybody, including Garwood? We're so thrilled to have you guys on board. They're having a big, long standing room only in Garwood. We're so glad you're here and joining us for Freeway. If you're new, Freeway is based actually on a series of six steps towards freedom in Christ. Last week, we looked at step one, awareness. Today, we're going to talk about discovery then get to ownership, forgiveness, acceptance, and finally get to freedom in Christ is the ultimate goal. We all want to be free, right? Free from guilt, free from shame, free from regret for past mistakes, and really set free to live in the love of God and the purpose he has for our lives because he has designed each of us for a purpose that is larger than your nine-to-five job. Well, last week I asked you to make a commitment just to be here on Sundays for this entire series because Freeway is designed to be a process. Each week kind of builds sequentially on the previous week, and what we're going to do is we're linking up the Sunday sermons with our small groups during the week. So you kind of need to hear the message on Sunday so you're prepared for your conversation during the week. You see probably people with white strings on their wrists. That's people who are involved in Freeway, and I'm already hearing some pretty cool stories about how this is impacting families and people in our church. Well, last Sunday, we took this first step on the freeway, and that is awareness. And uh, none of us really know the full truth about ourselves. And we acknowledge that the great enemy of self-awareness is not self-delusion. It's not pride. But the greatest enemy of self-awareness is hurry. We admitted that the speed of life can often prevent us from hearing the voice of God. And so God gives us the Sabbath as a gift. That's what we're celebrating right now, the Christian Sabbath, to slow us down so he can speak to our soul. And we kind of get to sit on his lap and allow our Father God to reveal things about ourselves that we need to learn. Now, the problem is some of us still kind of violate the Sabbath, right, to our peril. We go so fast, we actually never slow down and become aware of how God wants to grow us. But we learn freedom starts when we stop saying, I'm busy and start saying, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready for you to reveal my blind spots and show me the areas in my life where you want to grow me, which leads us to step number two, discovery. Today, we're going to discover what's under the hood or, or what's under the couch. You've been using this metaphor of kind of saying, you know, there's some messy parts of our lives like a quesadilla kind of lingering underneath the cushions of our couch that we don't really want to address. And sometimes you have to acknowledge what's under the cushions before God can step into your mess. I told you how I uh, drive an old truck, and periodically the check engine light comes on on the dashboard and kind of flashes, and half the time, I don't even want to know what the problem is because I'm so scared how much it's going to cost, right? You know, the smaller the light, the bigger the bill, it seems to me. But it, let's imagine that I took my old truck into the mechanic and said, you know, hey, I don't know what's wrong. The check engine light is going off. And the mechanic said, okay, pull in, and he pops the hood of my truck, what would happen if he saw this? Take a look at this. What do you think he'd say? <laughs> well, there's your, there's your problem right there. You done got a python in your engine, right? That's actually not Photoshop. That's a real-life picture in South Africa. Husband and wife were driving along. They hard, having car trouble. They popped the hood. There's a 16-foot rock python coiled around the engine, right? Again, some like problems in life are pretty obvious. You don't have to be an expert to diagnose it. Uh, let's say if you're a teacher or you work in education 
and the kids in your district struggle with uh, low reading scores, right? And you're like, why, why, do, why can't kids around here read? And then you see this sign on the elementary school, right? <laughs> the literacy night, you know? <laughs> why can't the kids read, I wonder, in our school, right? Well, there's your problem. The teachers can't spell literacy, right? Uh, some problems, again, obvious. You don't need to dig too deep, but others are not so obvious. You have to go digging a little bit to discover what's under the hood. And that's what this step of discovery is really all about. We're going to kind of push past our fears today, pop the hood, discover what's underneath. I'm going to invite you to pass, uh, push past your shame or maybe even your embarrassment about you know, looking stupid about the areas of my life that I feel defeated in and confront those areas that God wants to touch and heal. There's a great quote uh, by Frederick Buchner in the beginning of our workbook who said, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. Isn't that true? Beautiful and terrible. I mean, life is kind of this mix of joy and pain, like celebration and sadness kind of go hand in hand any day of the week. This past week, I had two experiences that left me kind of scratching my head. One was joy. Uh, I met with a friend whose wife is about to give birth to their first baby. They're going to have a daughter. They're like, we got the names picked out. We're so excited. We got the nursery ready to go. And they were, they were thrilled, right? Moment of joy and celebration. And that same day in the afternoon, I received news of a friend, only 40 years old, who died of a brain aneurysm, leaving behind his wife, three kids, two of them disabled kids who they adopted into their family. And it just, you know, you scratch your head. I mean, even as a pastor, sometimes I just don't understand God's ways and the things that he allows. But that's life on earth, right? It's equal parts joy and pain. There's sunshine and there's shadow. There are the the good parts, you know, the the birthday parties, the the weddings, you know, maybe your son or daughter is getting married or someone's having a baby. But then there are the really hard parts, the struggles with our loneliness, the fight with our muffin top, right? Uh, The kid who needs chemo again or, or that affair or this divorce. There's our silent suffering and our unseen addictions. And guys, these are the parts that we want to begin talking about in Freeway because it's really the dings and the dents. It's in the disappointments and devastations that God is most interested in in your life because none of us gets out of life like unscathed, right? We all suffer bruises, some broken bones along the way, but the Bible says that Jesus is a healer. He's called the great physician. And he doesn't just give us like a little Band-Aid or an Advil, you know, to mask our pain. He offers supernatural healing. And if we're honest, that's exactly what some of us need right now, healing. That may, uh, you know, see, Liquid is a different church. This may be new to you. Liquid is, I think, different than your typical church in in a pretty big way. See, in our church, it's okay to not be okay. That may be a new thought to some of you, depending on your background. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay to not be okay. Go ahead, tell them right now. Just let them know, right? Yeah. It's okay. Good. Awesome. Some places it's like, I'm okay, you're okay. We're like, no, it's okay to not be okay. And the reason that's a surprise is because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, church is the one place I better get my junk together, right? Or at least kind of sweep it under the couch cushions. Because a lot of us believe that, man, uh, you know, I got to cover up my scars. I got to sanitize my scandals. I got to kind of gloss over my grief because if anybody knew, you know, then I would have more guilt, there'd be more shame. I mean, can I ask you, let's start that way. Come jump on the couch with me, move this out of the way. What, what causes you shame? What, what are you embarrassed by in your life right now? What, what are you scared to death for the rest of us to find out? Some of, some of you are thinking like, um, I would be embarrassed if you knew what was going on in the parking garage 20 minutes ago, right? If you saw me screaming at my kids, you know, as we kind of skidded in here, right? Um, Or you'd be like, people would be shocked here if they knew my sexual history or discover I take Prozac. Uh, People, 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 some of you are, some of you are holding tight to the secret that you wear Spanx underneath your clothes (laughs) to keep your stomach sucked in, right? Or secretly eat your kid's Halloween candy, right? And you kind of blame the dog. Whoops, that's my secret. (laughs) We're, we're scared that if the world sees how messy our lives are, they, they won't like us. And the rest of the church will go, oh, no, I'm shocked, right? So we bury all those hurts and struggles underneath the, the, the couch cushions. We kind of pretend like 
uh, you know, we're okay, but we're not okay. And it's strange to me because in the family of God, see, with Christ followers, it's supposed to be just the opposite. Because of Jesus Christ and the fact that he's forgiven our sins, he's canceled our debt, I mean, all past sins, present and future, we are supposed to be the most confident people in the world about God's grace, his radical love for mess-ups like me. So we realize it's okay to not be okay. You are not going to be embarrassed or feel ashamed or made to feel guilty. If you are honest about your struggles in life, you know what you're going to discover? You're going to discover people here who go, me too, me too. That's how grace works. Before Jesus can heal us, we have to drop the facade and where we're faking like we're okay all the time. So as a lead pastor, let me just kind of officially declare in the church at all of our campuses, it's okay to not be okay. But listen, it's not okay to stay that way. God loves you too much to leave you stuck in your pain forever. And there does come a point where you have to invite Christ into your mess and believe he can actually heal you. That if you take off your religious mask and admit your secret struggles, Christ says, I can heal your heart and give you a free way to life. Remember, God's love is unconditional. It just means that it does not depend on your effort. It doesn't depend on your performance. Grace is given. It is never earned. And so right now, how does God feel about you? God's love is guaranteed. It is raiding at you, and nothing you do will make him love you ever more or less. And so understand that when you come to God's house, God does not say, hey, I want you to clean up your mess before you step foot in this house. Not at all. He simply says, get up on the couch with your father and let me be your source of identity and healing. He says, let's, let, let's, let's discover what's under here. Let me show you the free way to live. In fact, if you could come up here right now and sit on this couch next to God with your father, you know what your father, I think, would say to you today? I think he would say, I know. I know that you feel like you're failing as a parent. I know that you lie about your weight. <laughs> and you're out of, your eating feels out of control. I know you had a panic attack, and you're ashamed that anybody would ever find out. I know, I know everything about you. I know about your addictions and that you're scared you're just going to get sucked back in. I know that you're single and all your friends are starting to get married and you're pretending to be happy, but secretly you hate them. <laughs> I know, I know. And listen, 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 listen. I think he would look with grace and kindness in his eyes. I think he'd look right into yours and I think he'd say, my child, you are loved more than you know, and everything's going to be okay. Trust me. Hop up on my lap. Let me be a father to you. I gave my son Jesus for your freedom, and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit now. You have a new power to live, but you have to trust me. You have to take my hand and believe this is not as good as it gets, that I have more freedom from, for you than you have right now. So understand, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. God loves you too much to lay you stuck in your mess, and that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus is for you. Jesus really wants to help. So this is kind of an invitation to you today just to be about honest about where you are, about what's under the hood, what's lurking there. Whatever is broken, Jesus can heal, but you have to first kind of discover the place where you need God's healing the most. And to do that today, I want to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. So if you open your Bible or you flip there in your phone, uh, John is a story of healing. It's actually a supernatural healing story of a man who had a major limitation. This guy was born blind, but then he encounters Jesus who touches him in this place of tremendous brokenness, and he walks away seeing for the first time. This is John chapter 9. I'll start at verse 1. Here's what it says. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night's coming when no one can work. But while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. 
Wash in the pool of Siloam. That word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home what? Came home seeing. Somebody was blind. Jesus enters their life. He makes a mess. He opens their eyes. And they go home seeing for the first time from God's perspective, not theirs. As you start your journey of discovery this week, I just want to take a couple moments to unpack how Jesus heals this man with a severe limitation. You can't even really say that this guy had a few blind spots. He was born blind. So imagine, we don't know if he's 30, 40 years old. He spent his entire life in darkness, right? Imagine this, 40 years, hard to imagine. And Jesus says, okay, I'm the light of the world, and I'm going to illuminate your world with the glory of God. And he spits on the ground, he puts mud on his eyes, and he turns his mess into this this miracle of healing. The lights literally come on. Now, most of us today here are, are not blind physically, but we acknowledge that every single one of us have blind spots, right? There are things in our life that we can't even see ourselves. There are unhealthy habits. There are patterns. There's ways of relating that are dysfunctional. In other words, there's just part of our life, including me, that are not operating the way God originally designed and intended. But for some of us, it's from birth, like this guy. It's just how we were raised. We don't even know what normal is. We think anger in relationships. That's normal. Abuse or addiction in a home, that's normal. We don't know there's another reality to live in. And Jesus says, I want to turn the light on for you so you can discover the areas of your life that need my healing touch. And there are three big ideas we can learn from Jesus' healing of this blind man here, whatever your limitation is. And the first big idea is this. If you're taking notes, we find that God's healing begins when we ask the right questions. Look at verse 2. Notice the disciples actually start by asking the wrong question. His disciples ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Isn't that the most natural thing to ask when something goes wrong? Who's to blame? Who's responsible? How did this happen, right? Whenever there is a hurt or pain in your life, it's very natural to ask God, well, why did this happen? What caused this? Better yet, who is to blame? Is it him, the man, or is it his parents? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it mommy? Does he have daddy issues? Because in Jesus' day, there was no idea about grace. There was just karma. What goes around comes around. So if you were sick or you had a disability or a sickness, it was like, well, clearly it's your fault or somebody in your family. You're being punished by God for something you did. And so his disciples say, who sinned? But that's always the wrong question to start with. When there is pain or there's blindness in your life, here's a better question to ask. God, what are you doing? God, what are you about to do? I know God is good. He has promised to do work all things together to good for those who love him. God, what are you doing here? So Jesus actually corrects their thinking in verse 3. He says, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happens so that, let's read this together, the works of God might be displayed in him. Another translation says, so that the power of God might be seen in his life. In other words, what was the ultimate purpose of this man's pain? Jesus said, oh, that's easy. So that God might reveal his glory. Now, that's a new thought for some of us. I mean, what if I told you now today, your greatest weakness in life has the potential to be the source of God's greatest glory. The thing you wish had never happened. That divorce, God can use for his glory. Really? Really? That depression, God can use for his glory. Really? Really? That addiction, God can use for his glory. Really? Really? Just look at Megan, right? Megan sat on this couch two weeks ago. And you're like, how is it possible for a homeless heroin addict in her 20s, five or six siblings are addicts, she suddenly has her life turned around and then reconciles with her daughter? Well, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Jesus specializes in turnarounds, in turning our weaknesses into strengths that you you can only give credit to God. (laughs) You say, praise God, there's no other way to explain this. And God says, I want to put that on 3D Technicolor display. But you have to ask the right question. You cannot waste any time or energy asking, well, who's at fault? Who's to blame? Rather, ask this question. God, what are you doing in my life? What is Jesus about to do? Ask the right questions. As Mike Foster notes in our workbook, he says, the quest for healing 
begins with honest questions. What are my weaknesses? Who am I really? What am I hiding for others? What nagging fears do I carry on? What do I dwell on? You see, that's the first step in the healing, according to Jesus. You give honest answers to serious questions. That sets the groundwork for God's work in your life. So this week in your workbook, you're going to explore your story a little bit. You're going to pop the hood and see where God may already be at work by answering this question, what feels broken? And you'll see it says, check the box or boxes that apply, body, soul, mind, heart, other. Now, when I filled this out in my workbook on Wednesday, I checked heart because I said, you know what? I still feel grief over the loss of my dad four years ago. That's still rattling around in there, and there are times that I have tremendous sadness and grief about that. That was a big loss in my life. But then it says, go on a soul scavenger hunt and check the box for each question. Again, this is kind of interesting. It says, are you, are you worried or scared about anything? How are your relationships? Are you a people pleaser? I'm like, yes. Are you sleeping well? I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, how are you and God? I'm like, well, Wednesday I was good. Are you rest about anything? No. Are you angry about anything? Yes but I will not tell you their initials. Uh, <laughs> are you hiding a secret? No. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Yes. You feel excited? Yes. And again, this is going to be a mix for you. On any different given day of the week, you may answer these questions very, very differently. But the point is, is to be exceptionally honest in your time with God. Go on a soul scavenger hunt because God's already at work in your life. And healing begins when you ask the right questions. Big idea number one. But the second big idea here in John 9 is that you must then let Jesus open your eyes. Now remember, <laughs> this man in John 9, he's born blind, but we all are blind in some ways, right? Because of human frailty, right? We have weakness, we have limited perspective, and the point is, none of us know the full truth about ourselves. I actually had uh, someone here, a guy came up to me after last week's service, said, you know what, Tim? Let me just tell you, life is easier with my blind spots, Right? And then his wife was staying behind him. She goes, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, you know? But we all have these blind spots. In fact, this is kind of a funny thing, a little bit embarrassing. But this past week, I, I go to this meeting. You know, we're at that time. Of, we're like in transition mode between summer and fall. And so you're still wearing some of your summer clothes. So I go to this meeting. And like, it was warmer out. And so I had my sneakers on from the summer. And in the summer, I don't wear socks with my sneakers. But, you know, then they get a little skanky because they go, there, you know, you get sand in them. You work out and now they're sweating and all that. So I go in this meeting, and literally there's, there's two other women on our staff who are always impeccably dressed. They're just like put together, super professionals. And I'm like, oh, guys, it's hot in here. Can I? And I just take off my shoes. And I was like, all right, so what are we going to talk about? And as we're talking, I'm looking at one of them, and I'm like, wow, I, she didn't put on deodorant or something today. <laughs> I have allergies, and I don't smell really well, but I'm like, that is a serious funk, you know, but whatever. So I push through. We push through, and I'm literally in my head, I'm looking at her, and I'm like, no, I don't think it is her. Maybe it's Janet. Now, Janet's my assistant, who's like, she smells like roses the whole time, you know? And I'm just looking at Janet, I'm like, maybe it's her. And then, I was, and then I'm like, this is just the oddest thing. And then I go like this, I go, oh! <laughs> the, like, tears out of my eyes, my feet come up. It was my feet out of my sneakers. And so I said, guys, let's just pray for a minute. I'm like, put the shoes on, you know? I had no idea I was the one kicking up a funk. In fact, I was pretty certain it was the others, you know? And we all have these areas that we kick up a funk and everyone else knows it. But we're pretty sure it's them. Here in John 9, this guy has a physical disability. He's blind. But we all have this kind of spiritual blindness. Some, some of you suffer from religious pride, right? You're kind of like, ah, oh, the freeway, that's good. There are some weak people in this church who need that. <laughs> right? I think there's a few people. Um, you have no patience or tolerance for those who don't have it all together, right? So you kind of, you know, you might not say it, but you sort of judge them or roll your eyes inside. You're like, you know, I have some, yeah, we all have problems, but I just kind of power through. You just got to pray more and never look deep, right? And you don't realize others see you as an unsafe person. Or some of us have a cynical spirit. If sarcasm is your spiritual gift, raise your hand right now. You're like, I have the gift of sarcasm, all right? Uh, some of you have kind of a critical tongue. You just kind of slice and dice your way through life. And, and often it's funny, right? Like that's why you do it. But sometimes it goes beyond that. You're always sarcastic, always poking fun, always cutting others down, mocking them, pointing out how they could have done that a little bit better. And you don't see it. You're like, what's the big deal? But that kind of cynicism is like pouring battery acid on your relationships. 
It's like battery acid on your marriage, on your kids, on your friendships. But it's a blind spot. We don't see it. And honestly, that kind of spiritual blindness impacts those we love the most. That's why we have to invite Jesus to shine his light into it. He says here in verse 4, Jesus says, As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. But while I'm in the world, I am the what? The light of the world. So Jesus illuminates God's character. As the sinless son of God, he reveals the father. Jesus is God's plumb line in a dark and crooked world. And every one of us needs the light of Christ shined like a spotlight into the dark areas of our heart that need healing. You know, I remember the day that God shined his light in a very dark area of my heart. I didn't even realize it was there. God revealed a blind spot in my marriage I'd never seen before. This was like the late 90s. Colleen and I were first married, and Colleen and I had this like unhealthy cycle of handling conflict. So if there was a, a conflict or disagreement, um, Colleen would get a little bit more emotional than me. She is Italian. Uh, she is Irish. And I'm Dutch, so I would get quiet. I'd kind of shut down and withdraw, you know, and just smile like that and everything and just let her be crazy. You know, that's what I thought, right? And uh, I would wait until she was done sharing her feelings and understand something. I would nod my head, but I wasn't listening at all. Honestly, I was secretly thinking of all the things I was going to say to correct her after she was done. And I would just wait. I just let her just kind of vent, and then I would prepare my argument logically because I was a pretty good debater in school. I'm fairly verbally agile. <laughs> and when she was done, I would launch a very well-prepared response, and I am good, okay? I'm pretty verbally dexterous. My, my logic is linear. My argument's airtight, and I can counter what you're saying, cut off your idea, and explain why it's silly, stupid. No reasonable person in their right mind would ever think even such a thing. And so whenever we had a conflict, I remember this one time, Kyle was very upset and, and frustrated, and she was done and, you know, pretty emotional. And I went to work and debated her into a corner about why she shouldn't even feel that way. Blah, 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 blah. And I remember she said, you know, find him. She goes, you win. You win again. You always win, don't you? I was like, what? She goes, what do you want me to say? That you're smarter than me? That you're a better debater than me? Fine, you win. And instantly in that moment, I knew I lost. I was losing her heart. I was losing my wife's trust. I had never considered the fact before that my verbal dexterity, which is a strength and blessing to people on Sundays, <laughs> is a weakness in my marriage on Mondays. Now, literally, what's a blessing to many of you on Sunday was not a blessing to my wife at home. She felt steamrolled in our marriage whenever we disagreed, and she was right. That was a blind spot. I was, like, shocked. I was, like, outraged. I was, like, I cannot believe this. My solid, biblical, balanced response is not a blessing. <laughs> because, because, again, my, my arguments were very persuasive, but it was crushing my wife. It was actually suffocating her. She had no room to honestly express how she felt emotionally without me constantly correcting her. But I didn't see it. I was blind to it. Until the day God poured his light, Christ poured the truth of God. I was reading in my devotions from the book of James, and this verse struck me right between the eyes. James writes, be quick to listen and slow to what? Speak. For my first five years of marriage, I had this the other way around, okay? I was quick to speak and slow to listen. Why listen? I have all the answers. Why would you even bother? But James says, no, no, no. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. James is like, do the math. God gave you two ears and one mouth. In other words, he wants you to listen twice as much as you speak. But God shined this like bright light from his word in this dark part of my heart. And I realized, wow, part of loving another person is actually taking the time to understand their perspective. St. Francis of Assisi said, seek to understand before seeking to be understood. So when you're trying to understand someone, you don't actually listen for just the problem or the surface issue. Remember, we talked about this in Angry Birds. You look underneath the complaint, underneath their anger, underneath their issue. Because the truth is, hurt people hurt people. Healthy people don't hurt people. And holy people don't hurt people. So this is a key step in the journey to freedom and health. We have to let Jesus open our eyes, and shine the light of God's truth into the darker, shadowy places of our heart so we can discover what God wants to teach us. I know some of you are like, this is hitting a little too close to home, Tim. Don't check out on me. 
don't get afraid because you have to understand this. Before God makes you better, he sometimes makes a mess. Go back to John 9. Look at verse 6. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground. Turn to your neighbor and go, no, don't do that. (laughs) Made some what? Mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Now, imagine this. Like, enter the story. This guy's been blind for 40 years, and Jesus says, hey, today's the day. I'm going to restore your sight. And this guy must have been like, hallelujah, I have waited my whole life for this moment. Okay, go, hit me, Jesus. And Jesus goes, okay, you ready? Ready. (laughs) He spits on the ground, makes mud, and then smears it in this guy's eye. Right? Now, like, first, the poor guy is blind. Now he's muddy, you know? If I'm this guy, I'm like, uh, yeah, Jesus, this doesn't exactly feel like healing, okay? What's the point? Understand something. Jesus often makes a mess before he makes you better. Before things get permanently better, things get temporarily messier. Some of you know this. Before God does a supernatural work of healing in your life, have you ever noticed sometimes things get worse? I ever have someone, uh, I've had people tell me that. They say, yeah, Tim, it's the worst thing. So I finally decide, okay, I'm going to go to marriage counseling. Things got worse. They like feel betrayed, you know? I'm like, well, what did you think would happen? And they're like, well, I assume, you know, I would go and then, you know, basically condense 15 years of dysfunction and anger into 45 minutes and the counselor would pull out a magic wand and be like, voila, healed. $110, please. You know, like what? Those of you who've done counseling, uh, that ain't how it works, is it? (laughs) In fact, where there is deep spiritual blindness, understand, look, unhealthy patterns you've had since birth. This guy was blind since birth. He never even knew what it was like to see clearly. Things sometimes will get worse before God makes them better. So I want to encourage you this week. As you you pull stuff out from underneath the couch cushions in your group this week, understand, before God makes you better, sometimes Jesus makes a mess, and that's okay. Don't give up. Don't be scared. That's for somebody today, okay? Okay. When I wrote this, I really felt like God was saying, Tim, there is somebody here today who's about to drop out. They're looking at, at, at something painful in their past, and you, you know, the affair, the abuse, the addiction, whatever, and they're scared, and it's painful, and they're like, this is too much, and they're about to drop out and go back to faking it so they don't have to deal with it. But I feel like God is saying to you, trust me. Trust Jesus. God has healing for you. There actually is peace waiting on the other side of your pain, but you have to trust the process. As hard as this is, you have to press in and don't worry that you're not feeling better. Don't freak out that things are getting worse. God is sovereign. You know what that means? Everything's going according to plan, to his plan. Jesus knew what he was going to do in this man's life. He's a healer and he will heal you, but you have to be patient and persevere and trust him because sometimes Jesus makes a mess before he makes us better. He is the great physician. And he knows what he's doing, amen? And if you let him, he will turn your test into a testimony. This man born blind, his whole life in darkness, suddenly receives his sight. Verse 7, Jesus says, go, go wash off in the pool of Siloam. The word means sent. And so the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. I mean, imagine this. He spends, you know, four decades Wandering kind of in darkness, and boom, all of a sudden, the light bulb comes on. Sunlight pours into his world. Jesus turns his muddy mess into a miracle. And at first, nobody believes it, because when things change in your lives, people are like, what's that about? I'm not sure if that's real. Look at verse 8. This is so real. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging ask, hey, isn't this the same guy who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, no, I'm the man, <laughs> right? I often think like when Megan was sitting here the other day, she said, I, I, I don't know if any of my friends who are also homeless on the street ever would see this video online. But she's like, they won't even believe it's me, right? When someone's life literally turns around, you're like, how is that explainable? That's what they asked. How then were your eyes opened? He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I obeyed. I went and washed, and then I could what? 
C. First he made me dirty, then he made me clean. Once I was blind, but now I see. That, my friends, is called a testimony. A testimony is the story of what God's done in your life to change it for the good. How God takes something dirty and messy, like our sin, and washes it clean with Christ's blood, right? How once we were blind, but now by God's light, we actually see. We see clearly for the first time the impact we're having on others, what God's vision is for our life, and we start seeing our life from God's perspective, not our broken thinking. And to me, it's so cool. When you see someone's test, the limitations on their life, all of a sudden becomes this testimony to God's love and his power. That is so hopeful. If you're here today and you feel blind, you feel broken, you feel bruised in some part of your life, if you ask him, Jesus will do the same thing. He will turn your test into a testimony of his grace. The very thing that has kept you in the dark for years, ashamed, embarrassed, guilty, feeling defeated, Christ can turn that weakness into a strength. Because whenever the light of Christ enters our, our lives, God puts his glory on display. And that's the whole point of healing, isn't it? Remember, why did Jesus heal this guy? Because this guy deserved it. No. <laughs> Jesus says, this happened so that what? Say it together, church. The works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, this guy was allowed to suffer so that God's goodness, his glory and his grace and his power will be displayed. And people will be like, how did that happen? I don't know, God. He will do the same for you if you come to him with honesty and trust like Michelle did. Michelle's a friend, and like some of you, Michelle had a painful childhood. Her parents were not there. There were a lot of failures in her family. And as Michelle grew up, failed relationships followed her with men who took advantage of her. But then the man named Jesus Christ entered Michelle's life. He poured the light of his love into her life, opened her eyes, healed her heart. This is her testimony. There was a little girl who once thought love was something that you earn, something that came with pain because love hurt. A little girl who fought back tears when mommy refused to make the right choices. A little girl who begged daddy to love her because no one else did. The one who smiled because frowning was unattractive. The little girl who made the best grades so someone would take notice. Kept quiet when her feelings were hurt because no one likes a crybaby. How could someone love her if she complained and didn't do what everyone asked of her? She belonged to them because she needed them to love her. Then she found a guy to love her, a guy to hurt her so much that it had to be love, right? This is what love does. Pain is what love is. She was a little girl who kept all her feelings inside because no one had time to listen. The little girl that hid inside herself and pretended to be everyone but who she was because everyone was better than me. Me, the little girl with no one to love her. The little girl who was gullible and could be used up at any time by anybody who wanted to use her. I was a little girl who only cried in her bed because the pillows were the only ones who had time. Because mommy never learned how to be mommy and daddy forgot what daddy means to a little girl and the guy who loved me so much he hurt me only wanted to use me for what I could do for him. And here I stand in all my mess this pile of gunk of past distress, this mud and grime that I couldn't let go because back then I couldn't say no. All along I didn't realize there was a God who heard my cries, who would wipe away each stupid lie, useless, shameful, unloved, unclean. He came down in my mud for me. He stooped beside me and wiped my tears, cleansed my soul, erased my fears. He took my dirt, my grime, my shame and gave me life through his holy name. My God, my Savior, my Lord, my friend, he took me from them and made me his. I am his, shameless, blameless, set free, redeemed. He loves me in all my grime, my dirt, my funk. He picked me up, called my name, said my life was gonna change, that I would never be the same. I had no reason to be ashamed. No longer should I carry the blame because he loves me. He would take my shame, my past, my mess, and lay those dirty souls to rest because I am his. 
daughter, his creation, his precious child. No longer should I be defiled. This world is not my home at all. My life was changed when I heard his call. My God, I am grateful for all that you are. And as I lay my life down to you, I ask that you help me. Show all the little girls like me who thought real love could never be, who cry themselves to sleep at night, I pray they too will see your light. And they will see just like I do, that everything they're looking for, it all lies in you. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. Like Michelle, I pray that you will discover everything you're looking for is found right here in Jesus Christ. He is the God who made you, who loves you exactly as you are, and who desires to fix and restore the broken places you may have lost hope for. So my prayer for you is this. May God open your eyes this week. May the light of, of, of Christ's love flood you with this sense of new hope, of possibility that this is not as good as it gets. May you discover that your past does not have to impact your present any longer. And it is possible to walk in freedom. And as you share your story with your group this week, may you discover that it's okay to not be okay. But God loves you too much to let you stay that way, stuck in your pain. Jesus' desire is to turn your test into a testimony of his love and grace. And most importantly, may you discover time doesn't heal all wounds. Only Jesus Christ does, amen? And he is here and he is willing to do that for you today. So we're going to end today's service with a time of healing prayer. If you are aware of an area of your life, it could be physical pain, maybe you're suffering some, something, emotional, you're aware of some relational brokenness in your life that needs prayer, or spiritual, maybe they're just sins you've been struggling with or things you need God's power. We are going to pray and minister to you today. So let's bow our heads. Would you pray with me, all our campuses? We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to minister. Holy Spirit, come. Flood this place. You're already here. Jesus, we know that you alone have the power to heal what's wrong with us. And we know that because you died on a cross for our sins and you have canceled our debt to God. You've restored us to the love of the Father. And then, Jesus, you were raised from the dead. So we know you have power over sickness, over Satan, over sin, over death. You have authority right now, God, to give life and healing to any man or woman who humbly asks. So we just invite Jesus' resurrection power to manifest right here in our church. Holy Spirit, as we come with our hurts, our fears, our sins, wash us clean with your blood. And as we come to you with our weaknesses, turn them into strengths. Put your power and your love on display right now in the lives of your people. Jesus, you are our healer. And by your wounds, we are healed. Amen.